staff at the uh, CCSN for hosting the webinar today. I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Um, this really builds on multiple conversations that we've been having with patient advocacy groups, clinical leaders across the country and the pharmaceutical industry about um, both the opportunity and the challenge I think that we're facing in, in the cancer control system um, with the volume of drugs and the advantage that they're offering for patients and how to make that actually happen. So a little bit just very briefly about uh, me. Cancer has been almost my entire professional life. Uh, I worked in uh, front lines with families and patients directly, often very young because we were in the forces. Um, and so I saw directly the journey that patients would go through um, and access issues. And, uh, you know, so it, it, and I remember those stories fresh as though they were yesterday. Um, sometimes too fresh, um, as I'm sure is the case for many of you who've had experience with this disease, set of diseases. Um, so working at the Cancer Society, my role was to look at scientific evidence and determine how to synthesize that in a way that made sense. So complex issues and trying to help um, shed light on what that evidence tells us and where we might be able to put emphasis on the system is something that I've done for a long time. And I'm very, very um, close to the not-for-profit cancer community as well, the patient advocacy community, um, having spent a decade with them. Um, I certainly know they play a very important role in pushing the system to move in a direction that makes sure that voices are heard, um, there's equity in the system, and so I certainly applaud all of you for the work that I know you've done for a long time in this space. So my work at CAPCA started about seven years ago. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about an initiative that our CEOs, um, and I'll tell you who they are and how we're governed in a little bit, who, um, how they decided to focus on drug funding sustainability and what we're actually doing. And I will try and speak slowly because I tend to speak very, very quickly. So who is CAPCA? And I would say fairly, probably if you'd asked this question a year ago, a lot of people would say who? Um, and I think now it's becoming much more well known because of its work in drug funding, sustainability, and some of the engagement that's happened. So we are at CAPCA, the Canadian Association of Provincial Cancer Agencies, the only forum for the leaders of the cancer delivery system to come together and share information, talk about what's working, look at opportunities to work together more collaboratively across the country and to really advance and change the cancer delivery system, how care is delivered across Canada. It's the only table for that to happen. There are multiple other tables and discussions that take place about cancer care, often around standards or other aspects of cancer care, um, and so they're vitally important to the overall effort, but CAPCA is the only place where they talk about actually how care is delivered and what that means and how to improve it. So we are governed by a board of 11 people. Um, each of the CEOs, or if there isn't a CEO or a formal cancer agency in each province, it's the most senior person who's responsible for cancer, uh, that cancer delivery system in the province, um, from BC to Newfoundland. So you'll see um, across each side of the map, you'll see the name of the cancer agency where there is one in bold, and underneath that, you'll see the CEO or most senior person that's been appointed um, to sit on the CAPCA board and really guide our work. So our work at CAPCA is the work of the cancer programs, not the other way around. We don't determine what our priorities should be as a country, a pan-Canadian level. We, our priorities are determined by what the provinces are facing and where they want to focus, us to focus our efforts. So you'll see that, uh, just to note, that there are a number of practicing clinicians. We've had this question in the past. You know, who is the board and should they be involved in these discussions about um, cancer drug funding? Many of them are practicing clinicians who have, one of whom has just literally left a full-time clinical position. Um, so they have been immersed for most of their careers in the delivery of cancer care. Um, one of them is a pharmacist. Um, one is a radiation oncologist. So these are not, in the sense of the word, administrators um, that don't understand what it's like to sit in front of a patient or a family. All of them in some way have had that experience either as a nurse or a physician or a pharmacist. So that's who the board is. The 11th person who isn't named here is the CEO of the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. They're currently changing CEOs. The new, the new CEO, Cindy Morton, starts on the 24th, so soon. So her name isn't up there, but she's also on the board. So together they help us define what the issues are in the cancer delivery system that we, want, we should focus on. We work very, very closely with our partners. There were people working in the drug space, among them many of you, um, for many, many years before CAFCA came to the table. So, you know, we often take our cues from the work and opportunities that others who have more experience in the field have had. Among them, you'll see at the bottom CADIS, which is the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health, and their oncology-specific health technology assessment process run by the Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review. So you may hear me use the words CADIS or P-coder through the presentation. 
and we work extremely closely with them. The second major partner we work with is the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance and PCPA, which you may hear me use that term, is the entity that actually negotiates on behalf of participating provinces with manufacturers to get the best possible price um, before implementation happens. So we work with both the organization that does the, the review of scientific evidence to determine if the drug has a clinical impact and what that economic impact is as well as the entity that actually negotiates before a drug is put onto the formulary. So we work with both partners. And again, obviously, with the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. I won't speak in any detail about their work today, but I will say that they have been doing um, two big pieces of work in partnership with us. One is the deliberative public engagement. They funded um, six events that happened in 2016 to seek input around a public values framework. Um, and that's really remarkable work. And they've also done some work on real world evidence to help us understand once a drug is put into the system, do we see the same value in the general population that we saw in a clinical trial, which is typically under very, very tight, um, tightly controlled conditions. So there are partners. So unfortunately, the animation in this didn't work. Um, so you just, you'll, in the final version that you see, what you'll see now, I'll break this out into four separate slides. Um, in the animation, the first we're going to try again. Make the uh, animation work. I'll, uh, how's that? Okay, that's better. Can every, can everybody see that? Anybody see? There's a graph at the bottom. So, okay. So, um, this is we're facing an incredible opportunity and a challenge uh, today in cancer care. And the boxes in blue along the gray arrow are some of the factors that are challenging the system, I think, and giving us opportunity to do, uh, have better, uh, more impactful cancer care. And I'd like to go uh, through some of them to help um, provide some context. So the first blue box is growing incidence of cancer. Sorry, I feel like I'm going to hum so you have a momentary lapse in the presentation, but you might all leave. So just bear with us. Okay. So uh, on the bottom of this slide, this is a recently released publication from the Canadian Cancer uh, Society. It's their annual publication on Canadian cancer statistics. And the important takeaway from this for the first time, and I used to manage this publication when I was there, for the first time in history now, the, the risk of developing cancer in your lifetime has gone from one in two and a half to one in two. Um, and any um, change in that direction is a direction we don't want to see. On the right-hand side, you'll see a bar chart, and really the takeaway message from this is, is two. The black line that goes across the top, the wavy line across the top, really tells you about your, this is for men, similar graph available for women, um, tells you what your individual risk is of developing cancer. And fortunately, for a variety of reasons, your individual risk of cancer is actually declining overall. However, the blue bars that you'll see go up from left to right on the screen indicate the number of males who are being diagnosed with cancer, number of men being diagnosed with cancer um, over time. And unfortunately, that number is continuing to rise because our population is aging and growing in size. So the number of people who need care um, is growing. That's the first issue. Um, the second, and this is a, uh, what perhaps I think one of the biggest opportunities and the challenges in the system, we have an incredibly robust cancer drug pipeline in Canada, and we're very, very excited about the, the impact that offers for patients. Um, in this graph, which is publicly available, PCODER does an annual pipeline tracking report, so they will meet with manufacturers and act to get a sense of what we expect to see coming through the system. Um, so this is publicly available online, and it shows us over time the number of, new, number of manufacturers who they've met with, but also the number of distinct new drugs. Um, and the number of drug indication pairs. So this shows you both the number of new drugs that will be added to the system to treat uh, cancer, as well as existing drugs on the market for which there's research to look at a new indication or a new type of cancer. So another way to describe that is you may have a drug X on the market that treats lung cancer, but clinical trials are researching it in breast cancer, and that's called a new indication. So that's, we have as many as 300 that are coming in the short term. They won't all make it to market. Some will fail in clinical trials and not actually have the benefit we're hoping for, but if even half of those come through um, in a system that's already struggling to figure out how to fund the drugs currently in the system, thinking about the growth in the system is a real area of concern. Um, this third graph shows you, and this is Ontario data. Uh, now in Ontario, every province is a little bit different, but in Ontario, Cancer Care Ontario, that's the agency um, that's been identified by the ministry in Ontario to oversee cancer programs. 
Um, they only oversee IV drug budgets. They don't look at oral drug budgets. Um, so this is only the IV portion of cancer drug spending in, in Ontario. But what you will see is, again, that rise, similar to the number of people being diagnosed um, over time. Um, and in recent years, that increase has been about $50 million a year. So a sign and this, that trend is very, I don't have data here on other provinces, but that trend is the same in almost every province. Um, in fact, other jurisdictions around the world are facing the same issue. And then finally, um, in terms of high cost of drugs, this is a very small snapshot. It also only provides the list price of a drug. And if that's a term that may not be familiar to you, that means the price before any negotiations have taken place. And sometimes there may be rebates or other opportunities to draw that price down. This is the first price without any of those rebates or negotiated um, reductions. So as a comparison, the first two drugs are used to treat metastatic or advanced breast cancer. The first one is a generic version of the original, original drug and its list price a month is $39. The new drug that's just coming into the market soon, we hope, um, is $6,250 by comparison. Now they're different, um, but that just shows you the magnitude of the difference. The remaining drugs, um, bortezomib, lenalidomide, carfilzomib, and triplet therapy, um, are all used to treat multiple myeloma. And fortunately, there are, we're expecting a number of significant advances in this space. Um, these drugs individually are very expensive, and when you, uh, the trend now is to use those in combination together, so three of them together per month at list price is about $15,000. So just to give you a sense of the cost of the drugs at list price, all of those factors combined together are increasing the provincial drug budget at rates that they're concerned they're going to be able to sustain, and most importantly, if they can't sustain that growth, it means that they're concerned about being able to fund new innovative treatments. So we're trying to get ahead of that so that when really new innovative treatments come, the system is able to rapidly implement those. Heather? Yes. I'm just going to ask you, I think we're, we're in the presenter mode instead of the presentation mode. Uh, how's the, that, Chad? Are the, we better now? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Th thanks for tagging in there. Uh, we, we're, we have two screens going here, so uh, our apologies. Awesome. Sorry, Thank you. That. I don't know if, I don't think I have time to go back or you won't have time for questions, but you'll see the information in the slides when you get them. My apologies. So the Drug Funding Sustainability Initiative was established by the board of the CAPCA, the CAPCA Board of Directors, um, and they agreed to this and spoke with their ministry counterparts before we started the work and said, here's our concerns, here's why we're concerned, um, and we'd like to do something about this in, you know, to make sure that we continue to fund good cancer drugs. Um, and so this initiative has four components, um, some of which we're leading, and other parts of it we're working as good partners. So the first two you'll hear a lot about today, and that's really the work of the Cancer Drug Implementation Advisory Committee, to really optimize how cancer drugs are selected and used, to make sure that the best drugs are getting forward, and those that maybe don't offer a lot of advantage um, don't get first billing and first choice of payment. Um, secondly, to harmonize how new drugs are integrated into pathways and how they're implemented. And we've heard, and you've probably experienced across the country, that the same drug is not funded the same way in every province. So harmonizing that means that things will start to look more the same than they are different. Um, third, to uh, create a process to gather, analyze, and apply real-world evidence of a drug's effectiveness in the general population. And this is important. We, when a drug is approved, we will have clinical trial data Clinical trials are very tightly managed. There are very specific um, criteria that you have to meet uh, in order to participate in that trial, and patients tend to have a very selected number of other health conditions. They do have cancer, but they may not have many of the other things that the general population tends to have as we age and grow, unfortunately. So uh, looking at the drug's effectiveness once it's used in the general population where people do have other issues is real-world evidence, and we'd like to put a process in place to make sure we can assure that we're getting value for the money we're paying for these drugs. And then finally, um, to develop a process to look at the affordability of new drugs. And people might say, but isn't that already being done at CADAS Decoder? They do an amazing job looking at clinical effectiveness and looking at cost effectiveness. And the difference between cost effectiveness and affordability, cost effectiveness tells you whether the intervention, in this case it would be a drug, is good value for money. Affordability tells you whether you can afford it. So you may go to the grocery store and say, this is a great value, but you've only got $2 and it costs $4 and you have an affordability problem. So that's the difference. So what's the system look like today? Um, there are four essential steps in the process. Um, and forgive me if you've, some of you have heard this before, but I wasn't sure if there would be people who hadn't and I wanted to go through it. Um, Health Canada is the first part of the process. A manufacturer will submit an application 
um, to, to market the drug in Canada, and Health Canada looks at safety, efficacy of the drug, the quality of the manufacturing process, and they're also the mechanism to connect with patients and consumers and clinicians if there are alerts or more information about that drug. So that's the first important step in the process. PCODER and CADIF are working very hard to make sure that they're working as concurrently as possible with Health Canada, so overall the time to list a drug or to get access to a drug is as short as possible. Um, so where it used to be one after the other, I think they're working hard to make that closer, which is a great step forward. PCODER CADIF looks at cost effectiveness, clinical effectiveness, um, patient values, to the, and many of you may have participated in submitting something to PCODER, as well as implementation feasibility. So that's part of their deliberative framework, um, and they're well known and exceptional uh, in the work they do um, in those spaces. Um, the third step in the process, once they get a positive or a positive conditional recommendation, and a positive conditional recommendation says, we think you should fund this drug provinces, but the cost is too high, so you need to do something about that. So if one of those two things happens, it will go to the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, or PCPA, where provinces determine whether they want to opt into a negotiation where they work together with through PCPA and the manufacturer, and they look at delivering better value and a lower price. Once that final process, that process is completed, then it's over to the provinces and the, and the territories to determine how they can list that drug. So the star in the middle is where CDIC sits, and I'm going to go to the next slide and tell you about the Cancer Drug Implementation Advisory Committee, which is the work that CAPTA is leading. So CDIC is an advisory mechanism with the, um, to ministries of health through the CAPTA Board of Directors. It provides an opportunity to inform how, not just whether, a new drug should be implemented. Um, it, it really, there are discussions that are taking place um, as a new drug is implemented or put on a provincial formulary provinces are already discussing the many issues that we're discussing through CDIC. So what we've done essentially is bring those conversations that were only happening at a provincial level to a pan-Canadian level to again address some of the inconsistencies that we were seeing across the country. So many of this, these discussions are not net new discussions, so we're just elevating them beyond just a province to a pan-Canadian table so we can share more information and come to better, more consistent decisions. So we've had a lot of questions about how CDIC works, and we've tried a different, couple of different ways to visually describe it, and this one seems to do the best job, so if it's not perfect, it's better than some of the others. Um, essentially, you remember when I had the graph that showed the four essential steps in the drug review process currently, so, and you saw the yellow star in the middle. That yellow star essentially is the starting point, official starting point for CDIC's work, and that's a recommendation from PCODER's Pan-Canadian Expert Review Committee. Um, so what we would do for every drug that's coming through PCODER's process, we would, as we know that they're coming, we know when they're expected to be on the PERC agenda and when the recommendation is likely to come through, we will look at that drug initially in a very preliminary sense to try and identify whether there are implementation issues that we should be addressing at a pan-Canadian level. So we have a sense of how big they are, how complex they are, what they are, um, and then we hold until PERC has issued its recommendation. If it's positive or positive conditional, then we move on to the next step. If it's negative, our work stops, we do nothing, because a negative recommendation essentially says to the provinces, don't fund this drug. Um, so the first step after we get a PERC recommendation is to confirm what the provinces are thinking in terms of implementing that new drug, and that's where we would surface discussions around things like sequencing, and you'll hear me talk about that a few times with a presentation. So typically, just as an example, what would happen is if a new drug comes and it's used in previously untreated cancer patients, there may be other drugs that are used already for previously untreated cancer patients in that disease site. So a sequencing issue might be, what do we do now if we've got a new drug? Does everything in that line already stay? Does it get pushed into at? So it's an option after patients progress on this new treatment. What do we do with that? And every province was having those discussions already. Again, we're just elevating them. So the third step is to consult. Once we have a sense of what the implementation issues are and what the province's feelings are around it, um, or not feelings, intentions are with respect to implementing that drug, we will then, and this is a really important part of the process, we, we've had questions about, they're not necessarily the experts in that disease site, so what do you do? How do you make sure that you get the best expertise you can? We actually have one of two mechanisms to get expertise from clinicians, one of which is an online survey. So our CDIC members will identify the most expert person in their province or people on that disease site. We'll identify the questions, send them to them, they'll respond, and we, we, they review all of those responses. But we're also testing our ad hoc panels where we bring these provincial leads together across the country on the call and we let them, they talk to each other. 
they advise us, we write the summary up, it goes back to them so they can approve it and say that is what we said, and then it goes to CDIT for consideration. So the fourth step is to consolidate all of that. We have a final discussion, we understand how it's going to be implemented, how provinces want to implement, we understand the implementation issues, and we develop a recommendation that is then shared with the capital board of directors if they support it, and they often go back and talk to their clinicians and their pharmacy people to make sure they understand the conversation before they make a decision. Um, if they approve it, then it goes to the ministries of health in each province through the CAPCA board member. Um, so the piece on the bottom, and a, another really important part is to know that PCPA-led negotiations will begin at some point after the PERC recommendation. Our work ends before the negotiations finish. So we are doing this work concurrently. Our, our full intention is to prime the system to expedite the process so that when the final negotiation, when negotiations are done, the provinces are actually ready to list the drug consistently. What this, what this process does not address is how much money the provinces actually have to pay for drugs. So when they do have money, we hope that they'll list it consistently and our, we have one input into ministries about how that should happen. So that's CDIC and how it works. I'd like to talk very quickly about the stakeholder consultation that we went through. So you, some of you, many of you may have participated. We had a process that was announced in December of 2016 and ended in April. It was a four-step process initial, with initial introductory webinars going over many of the, the, much of the same content I've gone over today and asking questions. Then we had online feedback over a period of time. People could ask questions and we used those questions to shape the roundtable agenda. We had four, six roundtables actually. Um, we had two, one in Vancouver, one in Toronto, where patient advo advocacy groups and the pharmaceutical industry came together um, to participate in that half-day event. We also had two specifically for the patient advocacy community um, at the end of April, and we've had two specifically for clinicians, one for general medical oncologists and one for hematologists, um, because there tend to be very different um, kinds of clinician groups. And then finally, an online survey. Um, in total, we had 233 people, sorry, 323 people participate in that process. We had 90 odd pages of submissions to the last survey, so people told us repeatedly and clearly what they expected out of the system, and the consistency of response from um, everybody, regardless of sector, was very, very, very similar. So what were the themes? Um, Six themes really to walk through. Um, first, to make sure that our focus is not around cost containment, but our focus is around making sure that patients have access to innovative evidence-based cancer treatment. Um, there was concern that we were presenting this as a cost containment issue, and surely finances are an issue, but this is about getting the best drugs to patients. Um, secondly, um, through PCODER and the work that they've done, they've established a new benchmark in this country for how patients and pharmaceutical industry representatives are involved in drug decisions. Um, and they felt that we were lacking, and so we're doing some work to address that. Uh, finally, to be number three, to be transparent and to do more around addressing um, efficiencies, uh, reducing elimination in the system, so a conversation is happening at the right point by the right people and not twice. There are the first three. Second three, um, uh, so you may have noticed on an earlier slide that one of the organizations working in this space already does look at implementation feasibility. So people were asking us questions about is there an opportunity for us to bring some of that work so it's happening once, not in two different tables. And we're actively working and people have been incredibly receptive to those discussions um, to seeing what the possibilities are. Um, five, uh, you know, our system around real world evidence is not perfect. I think there's a lot of room for us to grow and to be first in class, uh, to be among class even. Um, and so we need to do a lot of work, not only working with uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the public system, but I think there is work that patient advocacy groups, if they have patient uh, data sets, we need to find a way to understand them and if it's appropriate to engage them in including that information. And finally, and importantly, for those of you around the table, I mean, I spent 10 years at a not-for-profit and I understand and now I'm, a, I'm at an organization that I describe as a snowflake on an iceberg. We are pretty small, but the agencies that we represent and work with are not. Um, but what we're hearing from patient advocacy groups is that they're struggling to find the time to submit to PCODER to get the data that it's meaningful to contribute to the conversation. And as therapy gets more targeted, um, and as we develop more therapies and there are more drugs going through the system, that workload will increase. And that's a real concern for those of you who are running volunteer organizations um, with patients who often are sick. So our response to those, um, so we want to make sure, well, we are making sure that our work does not slow the process down. We're doing our work as concurrent as possible. 
We, so far, every discussion we've had has ended before PCPA's work is completed, so we are not slowing that process down at all. And we are starting to collect some metrics so that we can actually assess that over time. We're, we're going to be starting to collect some metrics. We're not doing it yet. Um, we're also, we heard very clearly because of the work that P. Coder had done um, around engaging patients and families, we're, so we started a process to include a patient representative, a family representative, and a public representative on CDIC. Um, so that work is in progress. I can't say exactly when I expect that to happen, but my goal is to have those three individuals oriented to our work in the system um, by early September and to have them then join the CDIC as quickly after that as possible. Number three, to make our membership mandate and process public, which we have done on CAPCA.ca. Number four, to explore options to enhance RWE or real world evidence collection. So we are, we've had one call with uh, an industry association group to start thinking about that and we plan to do that regularly. Um, and five, to focus on, again, the right conversation at the right time with the right people so there's no duplication of effort. People are resoundingly concerned about this process being too slow and making sure access is um, preserved and we support that. We support preserving access as well. Uh, so current status, I mentioned key performance indicators. So we'd like to obviously work with CADIS, PCOTER, and PCPA so we understand when a drug is submitted, when PC, um, the PERC recommendation is finalized, when our work starts, when PCPA ends so that we can monitor timelines. Again, I've talked to you about patients and families. We've identified that process through existing patients and family advisory councils in provinces where they have them. Um, and we're exploring options for public representation. Uh, I've mentioned that we've put the membership mandate and process on CAPCA.ca. I will say as well that, uh, and I expect a question on this uh, in the Q&A period, um, we, the recommendations from CDIC are not going to be made public. Um, and the reason for that is it's one input to the ministries, of which they have many. Um, and, and so the, the, it's as one input, it will be, um, it's just not being made public at this point. And then finally, in terms of the discussion around with other organizations, we have a, a CEO panel where the CEOs of CADA, PCPA, two of the ADMs, our own CEO, and the lead for uh, CDIC, who's a CEO, um, come together and make sure that we're talking about transitioning and workload and where it should happen. So this is not just kind of a staff level process. We're engaging the leadership of all of these organizations and the best solution for Canadians. Final closing thoughts, and I hope I'm not going too far over. Um, you know, I, 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 these are very hard things to do in a webinar. I much prefer them to do them over the phone. There's a, there's a um, genuineness, I think, I hope that you feel uh, that I convey on behalf of the people that I work with that, you know, our goal, everybody's goal, I think a shared goal across the country, irrespective of where you come from, is to make sure that we're providing access to high quality evidence-based cancer drugs. In light of the number of drugs that are coming, budget issues, um, you know, that is going to be a challenge unless we have a different kind of system that helps us identify and fund the most impactful drugs ahead of the drugs that maybe don't offer a lot of benefit but take resources away from where else we might fund in the system. And we're not alone in this. Both, believe it or not, even, even in the United States where the cost of drugs is very much higher than Canada, the UK and Australia are dealing with very, very similar issues. So we're not alone. We just have to find a solution that fits for Canadians. Um, our work is at a very early stage, and I know that people probably around this table were involved in PCOTER at, at it, its first stages. In fact, I was sitting two offices down from Mona Saberwall when PCOTER started, um, and I remember how small it was, and I remember the whiteboards where they mapped out how this would work. So it's not an excuse to say we're not as good as them yet. It's just a fact to say that we're, you know, kind of a year and a bit into a process. They're 10 years of full-on running in a process, and so we're working to be as good as they are. Um, and finally, we, we really look forward to hearing from you. I think this is an, an opportunity. Um, I'll try and answer your questions as honestly as I can. There may be a few that I'm unable to answer, but I will do my best to be as honest and transparent as I can. Thank you. Thanks very much, Heather, uh, and especially for, for coming in today. Um, uh, that was a very rapid uh, but extensive overview of, uh, of how CDAC is operating. Uh, we've already got some excellent questions from people on the line, and I thought I would just kick it off. You described um, uh, Kafka as a snowflake on uh, an iceberg. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Kafka and the kind of expertise that, that, that you have in terms of staff? Uh, and then how do you make sure that, that you know, the, the right expertise is brought to any given, given product? I mean, you hinted at it before, but 
you know, do you have economists uh, with you? Do you have clinicians on staff? Who, who is CAPCA? Hmm. Good question. Um, so uh, CAPCA centrally, as opposed to our members, we're a very small team. So uh, on our team, we have um, Sarah Hicks, who's a communications expert, and helps us to make sure that the way we present things is clear and understandable. Um, and if it's not, it's because I've overruled her and I've confused it. Um, secondly, we have a medical oncologist who is the head of systemic therapy at the BC Cancer Agency. Um, she's a practicing clinician and she works with us part-time. She's also a member of the Pan-Canadian Expert Review Committee at PCODER, so knows that process and the data extremely well and is a practicing clinician. Um, Nyanda Penner, who is a pharmacist at, um, a senior pharmacist at CADIS, um, works with us part-time, so obviously knows that process extremely well and helps us to build the appropriate bridges between our work, so we're not, um, we don't have any inefficiencies in the system. And then, of course, just given the work and making sure things run smoothly, someone who has a bit of project management experience also helps us. So again, we're, you know, very small, all part-time, almost all virtual team. Um, and I say that hesitantly only because I don't want to diminish the fact that we represent um, together organizations that probably consume about $7 billion worth of healthcare dollars in providing care to cancer patients. So, um, example, Cancer Care Ontario is a leading organization in a lot of the work that is being done in cancer care and is tremendously large. BCCA is very, very large. So, where they tell us it's a priority, they help to augment our central resources by giving us their own staff, their own expertise and additional money to support that particular initiative, which is really how this work is going forward. So. Um, we're small, but we rely on a lot of expertise across the country. And the second part, I think, to your question, Bill, is around how we get expertise. So, um, you know, again, I'll just reinforce the fact that when we need input from clinicians, we will go to the CEOs in each program and say, we're setting up a panel. We want the best in your province to participate. Who is that? So we rely on their judgment. They know their clinicians best. They know who heads their tumor panels and who can participate in the discussion. And maybe they don't have that specific subpopulation expertise, if it's a different kind of CL, uh, leukemia that we're looking at a drug for, they know exactly who the treater is in their province who knows the most, and they give us those names and they encourage them to participate. Um, and so we rely on those people to give us the insight that CDIC may not have. Um, in terms of other expertise on CDIC, we do have a medical ethicist, um, and we do get advice from health economists and economists across the country and people who have experience and um, academic experience and practical experience in health technology assessment and policy. So we draw on what we don't have um, for the purpose that we need. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let's turn it over to the, uh, the, the participants. Peter, uh, thank, thanks. I can always rely on you to ask some, some really good questions. Um, wanting to know uh, about the standard of patient group involvement uh, in evaluation of, of new medicines and, and uh, Peter, I would agree, because um, we've looked a lot at what PCODER has accomplished. PCODER has set that standard in many ways, um, starting with guiding principles for how it operates right through to how, I think you mentioned uh, those whiteboards uh, when it was a fledgling organization. Uh, will the CAPCA process um, meet that standard or, or attempt to achieve a similar standard? And if so, uh, how you mentioned that you're going to bring some patients and, and family members and a public rep representative onto the, the committee. Is there anything else uh, that, that, that you know the patients need to know to, to have confidence that you're going to be taking that approach as well? So uh, another great question. Um, I, I think I, the perspectives that we'll get from having a patient and a family member and a pub member of the public representative at CBIC. Um, certainly will augment what we do. It, uh, we've heard and we know that people think we should do more, that that's not enough, that uh, the patient who sits around the table brings their perspective but may not have, probably won't have the capacity to link into a broader network um, in a disease-specific state. And they're all volunteers, and so it would be probably difficult for us to ask them to do that. So um, that is an area that I think we are going to have to continue to explore to make sure that um, you know, we're striving to meet that bar. Um, you know, I think part of the challenge too for us is to make sure that we, and this is partly uh, met by having people on our team who are so involved in PCODER. I mean, obviously nothing that's confidential ever gets shared. We would rely on publicly available information um, on the final PERC recommendation that talks about what the patients had submitted, patient submissions had come in. And that all is part of the discussion that takes place. So there's a full recognition of the value of it. Um, do we have the, the most appropriate mechanism to do that yet? I would say probably not. Um, is there interest in moving in that direction over time? I would say yes. Okay, great. 
Um, Barry, uh, uh, it's great to hear from you as well. Uh, and you're you're looking to uh, to, to hear from uh, from from Kafka uh, about specific recommendations that have already been made and what parameters um, were around those those decisions and and those deliberations. Um, you know, can you give us a, a concrete example of where and how CDAC can actually make a difference or has? Uh, and you know, although you're, you're saying that we're not going to make the recommendations public, uh, you know, it would be great to hear um, some, uh, some specific examples of, of how and where you have made a difference, uh, so that so that patients can can know a little bit more. Sure. Um, hi, Barry. Um, thanks for your question. Um, so, and, and I expected this would be a question that would come up. Um, so, without being specific, obviously, because the board has asked me not to, and we said to the uh, ministry staff that oversee provincial drug budgets that we won't be specific. Um, so, I'm, I'm deliberately feeling as though this is a bit vague, but this is the best that I can give you. So, I'll give you an example right now. There are a number of drugs coming through the PCOTA process for um, hematologic cancers all used uh, very expensive drugs, um, used in, generally speaking, the same place in therapy. So I'm, I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with concepts like first and second line, but first line would be previously untreated um, in that particular uh, space. Second line would be after you, your disease has progressed or you need an alternate treatment, you would go on to a second line therapy. So for treatments that are coming through for this, essentially the same line in therapy or place in therapy, how do we make decisions about what gets funded if they're all very, very expensive? Do clinicians have a choice in how they get funded? Um, and if those new treatments are being used uh, three together, which is what's happening, um, and two of them are already used in combination in the system, what do we do with the two? Are they still, do, you, do you, physicians still have the choice of two or three together? How do we make those decisions in the best way, given that when PERC goes through this review, they consider sequencing and they consider how to use new therapy in line with existing therapy and often say, we are unable to give you an evidence-based recommendation. Um, so that's an example where CDIC will look at the therapies, talk directly to clinicians and ask for their advice on what would they like to see happen for their patients in the community and make that part of the recommendation. That's right. as specific as I can be. Um, you mentioned earlier, this is a, you know, we'll, we'll go back to the online questions. Um, about you're trying to prime the system and actually get them ready to be able to implement it in a more harmonized way. Uh, what does that mean uh, tangibly in terms of uh, uh, the actual health system uh, being ready to take on some of these new lines of therapy? Is there, is there a role for, for CDAC and for CAPCA uh, to be able to prepare New Brunswick to be as ready for that product as uh, you know British Columbia is going to be? Yeah, it's, uh, that's precisely uh, the foundational reason for this being in, uh, in existence. What would typically have happened, from what I understand, because I haven't worked in a province um, with a provincial cancer program, but what they're telling me what would happen previously um, is the drug would go through the process and it would be at the point of, they all know that it's coming, so they're if either involved in the provincial advisory group at PCODER, so they have those discussions at the front end of a submission, um, or they're just really smart and they know their disease sites and so they follow clinical trials, which many of them do. Um, often what we would find is that they would wait until uh, the final negotiation was complete before they started actually thinking about what does the funding criteria actually look like? So how do we write that? Um, what are the implementation issues? And then they would start a separate process. That wasn't always the case, but that happened more often than not. Um, and I think the other piece of that is because those conversations were happening within each province, um, they weren't happening at a pan-Canadian level. I think acutely what we're hearing from almost everybody we've spoken to is that it, it looks different. It's like a quilt. Nothing's quite the same, and people can't understand why it's not the same. I can, it's separate from the issue of how much money provinces have to fund drugs, and that is something I'm not going to be able to address at all in this work. Um, some provinces will always have more, and some will have less, and that's an inherent problem that someone else is going to have to deal with. But what we can help to deal with is when you are ready to implement, let's make it look more the same than different. Uh, and so that's what priming the system means. So we would already say, if you're going to implement this drug, these are the conditions under which you, it should be implemented, consistent with the PCOTA recommendation, um, taking into account the clinical, clinical expertise that we've had. So when they go to implement, they've already got that work done. It's done before PCPA finishes negotiation. So it's not pushing a button, but it's a lot less work to push the button. Okay, excellent. And, and Barry, back to you, you have a great question around would CDAC's recommendation in, for example, sequencing of drugs affect 
physician tumor board's ability to make uh, recommendations on in an individual patient basis in each province? In other words, is that going to be the same button across the country, or is there still going to be some level of uh, independence uh, for for uh, tumor boards and, and treating oncologists? So uh, I can say almost um, unabashedly that there will always be a mechanism for those individual case-by-case -case decisions in the provinces uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, so they And they all have processes in place to, to deal with those unique patient situations. This will not change that at all. So that mechanism um, will stay in the hands of the provinces and I think it's really important for patients and clinicians when there is a kind of an outside situation we need to find a way to deal with it. Okay, excellent. I should tell listeners that as you can see uh, with, with my screen share that I've moved on to a Q&A slide and I've taken it off the dual slide here because it wasn't really working well but there are a bunch of themes that um, I think we've actually covered. It's almost a bingo sheet. We can check off certain <laughs> uh, themes that we've, we've, we've already talked about um, but I have to say the, the participants are coming up with, with better questions and themes than, than, than I could, which is no surprise because you, you, you have lived experience and many of you are more experienced than I am. Uh, Peter, you have a great question. Uh, there is an HTA tool, or I should say set of tools to assess cost effectiveness. Is there a similar tool to assess affordability that, that, uh, that either you're looking for or you've got a, a, you know, a handle on? So, uh, PCoder uh, does, you're absolutely right, um, Peter, PCoder has a number of tools that help the provinces in support of the provinces' discussions around um, implementing new drugs, around cost effectiveness. Um, what, what is absent from the discussion to this point is are issues around affordability. And so in order to make, similarly, I would imagine, um, to make an affordability a standard, transparent, uh, consistently approached part of the discussion around implementation of new drugs, a tool that has drop-down menus and categories to fill out that end users have an opportunity to influence, um, that people would have an opportunity to look at and comment on, would certainly be the way to go. I mean, if it's working for PCoder, it would be difficult to imagine that we wouldn't have something similar. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, the transparency issue keeps on coming back, uh, and I think that there's a challenge raised by, by, by Tony on, on the line. Uh, if, uh, if manufacturers don't know what recommendations have made it, been made in the past, how can they be informed about what they should bring forward in terms of potential uh, value or, or discussions that would actually address some of the issues that CDAC is raising if there isn't that kind of um, you know, experience that, that's actually made, made more public. That, and I think the same challenge can be put out for, from patients as well. So uh, you know, some of these transparency questions, we, you know, we could actually spend a whole uh, session on, I think. Um, but do you have any initial thoughts on that and, and how uh, it sort of goes to my earlier question with a specific example. Uh, people need to learn from how this thing is actually working if they're going to be able to be able to participate in it effectively. Yeah, it's a, that's a, an important uh, comment. You know, I think at, at minimum the opportunity to identify lessons learned through the discussions around implementation. So even if we were in a position to be able to share, here's some big categories of unanswered questions. Uh, at this point in the process, we still don't have an answer to it, and yet we need an answer, we being the payers, not me. Um, our members and the payers need answers to in order to fund a drug. Um, we're not making up new questions. We're actually trying to answer questions that are fundamental to the decision-making process um, and the, the actual operational process of getting a drug into the hands of patients. Um, so, uh, and I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Can you just go back? My apologies. Yeah, no, it's not a problem. It's, it's having access ah. to the, the, the recommendations in the past to inform uh, interaction to be able to support yeah. better recommendations. So, so I'm, I'm going to take away from this and think about whether there's a way we can communicate buckets of uncertainty and concern and gaps that we need to address um, because I do think that would be helpful. It's hard to hit a target you can't see. Um, the second issue, though, that I would say is uh, I would go into, if you're a manufacturer, um, I would certainly consider the issue of sequencing remains a consistent problem. Um, and I expect, um, I did spend a very brief amount of time, very positive experience with the pharmaceutical industry many years ago, um, and, I, and I know because of the exceptional experience, uh, expertise that they have in the disease states for which they're developing new drugs, um, that you know. Uh, companies will know where their drugs should fit in therapy, and if that is clear, um, you know, a funding out potential funding alg algorithm as a starting point might be an interesting concept to discuss as part of the submission process. 
Um, as part of affordability, I would certainly think about, um, you know, just to be really frank, if if we were in a position where drugs cost a dollar, I'm not sure we'd have any pharmaceutical industries to produce them, but we wouldn't be in this circumstance. Um, so we need to find a better balance of getting better value for money so that more of these drugs can be on the market. So I think as part of that um, pricing process and, and marketing process, really just being aware that this is a challenge that's not, we don't foresee going away. So we have to do a better job at, you know, confronting affordability. And if that can be part of the upfront process, it starts the conversation earlier. And that's better than kind of trying to thread the needle of a pin or the head of a needle um, at the tail end when you want the drug on the market. So uh, one comment, and, and thank you, Louise, for, for being on as well. Uh, doesn't PCPA negotiate affordability? And I think this goes to what are the policy gaps and rationale for CVAC to begin with? Um, are, you know, are they not achieving that through those negotiations already? Uh, and then earlier on, you know, a lot of your evaluations couldn't they be rolled into P Coder and what PERC already does? Hmm. And I know you have such overlap too. You know, what's really missing in the current process that, that, that this committee is, is, is needed? That's a lot of questions. I'm going to try and pick two. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first, what's missing? Why do we exist in the first place? Not just if there's a sustainability issues, because there are, um, but why did we set up this process in the first place. So there obviously was something missing. Um, so CADAS Decoder, again, just to reinforce, they do an exceptional job at the work that they do. But there are a number of um, issues that the payer at the end result has to deal with because they're not adequately dealt with up front in the system. So as an example, 80% of the drugs that go through a PCOTR8 health technology assessment are given a positive or a positive conditional recommendation. Um, when budgets are a problem and you want to get the most effective drugs into the hands of Canadians and into clinicians, um, it's not an adequate differentiator of those drugs. So what we get is positive, positive, conditional. What we don't know is among the 80%, which are the ones we absolutely have to have, and where does that signal come from in a consistent way where everybody knows how they got to that point. So that's, a miss, that's an example of a missing part at the front end. So to the, Louise's question about doesn't PCPA look at value, they actually address value in a way that by negotiating together, your volume increases. So presumably the price will drop a little bit, we hope a lot, um, through that process. However, what, they, what nobody does in the system right now in Canada is really address affordability. So we know that there's this trigger mechanism for drugs that are, um, the impact of implementing that drug is so significant that we're concerned that we think we need to put additional measures in place to make sure that's a wise investment of Canadian taxpayer dollars. So if it's a, if it's a drug that costs 15% of the overall budget, and that's much higher than what we would ever consider funding before, do we need to monitor through real-world evidence a little bit more carefully to make sure we're actually getting the value that we're paying for? Because at the end of the day, um, we are making trade-offs. Every decision in cancer care, every decision in healthcare, where you give to an area if it's funding a drug, it means you have less of an ability to fund something else. And I think to not recognize that means uh, you know, this is the challenge that we're in. We want to make sure that we're appropriately putting resources in the right place and for these very, very high cost drugs. Maybe that's the exact investment we should be making in the system. And if it isn't, wouldn't you want to know as early as possible so you can make a better choice? And that's, that's what an affordability discussion is all about. Gotcha. Um, a, good, a couple of questions from Quebec. Um, where and how does ENES fit into this, uh, the, this system? Uh, how do you integrate ENES insights? And, um, again, from a patient group based in Quebec, are you going to be going there to actually meet with those with those groups uh, in, in the coming weeks, as you I think you have in, in other provinces? Um, so I, I neglected to actually say that in that CEO panel that we bring together to talk about how the system is working for cancer care, Ines is CEO is part of that. So Dr. Luc Bouillot, um, and we also have a member of Ines who sits on CDIC. So for every discussion that comes forward, if there's information that they're able to share to advance our discussions. You know, we've built those mechanisms in already. Um, the reality is uh, there are exceptional things that NS does that aren't done elsewhere in the system. And it, it's a complicated system. So we are working more closely, I think, with Quebec um, and NS in particular than I think ever in the past, uh, which is great news and is, I think, really a testament to the fact that we're all facing a similar problem and we want to do the right thing. So let's all talk about it together. 
Um, will we go to Quebec? You know, certainly what we've done in any province that we've been in, we've taken our cues from those who are in leadership positions in that province about when the right time is. Um, we did have an event that tentatively had been planned in Montreal and it was cancelled for a variety of reasons and we haven't been able to reschedule. So um, I guess in some we are having conversations. I think the relationship and discussions have been very, very positive. Are we actually meeting with people in Quebec? Not yet. Okay, thank you. Um, questions around real world evidence and then we're going to get back into the patient member because there's some real interest in how do I apply, what's the, what's, what's the system that you're going to actually uh, put in place to, um, to recruit? Um, and when one, actually maybe we should start with that, uh, you know, um, can, can patients nominate who they want to actually represent them? Is that possible? Like what, what, what's the system going to be? Uh, okay, so you want me to answer that first and then go to real Start work? that and then, okay. we'll, then I've got a specific one on RWD. Okay. Um, so when we took the final report from the consultation process to the CAPCA board, and I, I think I was, um, I tried to be as descriptive uh, in my language and approach as I possibly could to help see, help them have a flavor of the, what I had heard directly from people. Um, this being an important issue and what they had decided was at least as an initial step that the patient and family representative would be identified from among existing patient and family advisory councils where they exist in provinces. So we've brought together the uh, staff leads of those councils from seven provinces and uh, explained the work we're doing, talked about the kind of um, input that we were hoping we can get from those representatives um, and we've asked them to go through a process within the province to identify people that they think would be um, you know interested and could participate we do meet on fairly regularly and they're fairly detailed conversations so there is a process in place currently to find those representatives I think that's the first approach we've had so that's liable to change so at this point recommending someone is probably not going to be a feasible alternative but it may be a future change that we make um, on the public side, um, as I mentioned earlier, CPAC had funded this work called Deliberative Public Engagement. So um, working with a group called Asking Canadians, they identified based on uh, criteria that were established ahead of time, um, people from all walks of life. So all ages, they, some had had cancer, some had other diseases, different economic um, situations, academic, some were very educated, others were per, um, perhaps somewhat less educated. So it was a real sampling of Canadians and they did them in uh, four different provinces and had one pan-Canadian event. So what we've done is the first step to get the public involved because all of those participants now have some understanding how the drug system works. We're trying to work through a process um, to identify someone who participated in one of those. Again, it's the first step to engage in them in CDIC and I think that process would change over time. But we were really anxious. What we heard about was people wanted this to be in place soon. So these were mechanisms that we could put in place re relatively quickly and get that representation and that voice around the table as quickly as possible. And a quick follow on mm -hmm. there, do you, do you see, foresee that the role of that patient representative? And again, I heard potentially up to three new members of CDAC. And that's actually something I, I, I was thinking uh, from, you know, that's a really large committee. You already have 18 spots around that table. You're going to add three more. Would that patient role be to liaise with the external community potentially as well, and, and uh, or or to sort of just bring that voice within within that bubble? How do you see that actually working? Initially, certainly would be just to bring the not just to bring the very important voice of the patient to the table. Um, and in individual patients, we see many many times um, really alter the dynamics and the conversation that takes place because they they live this experience. They really there's there's no. Um, getting around an issue when the patient has experienced it. You can't deny it. It's, you know, the way it is. So, so very important that that happens. Uh, you know, there are, having come from the not-for-profit world uh, in a cancer center, there are more than 200 not-for-profit charities with the word cancer in their name. Um, I think we'd never get a volunteer if we asked them to liaise with even some of those groups. So that would not be our initial expectation. So I think we need to continue to explore how we strengthen the voice that we hear. Okay, excellent. And speaking of voice or voices, uh, we've got a few good suggestions. We've, we've, uh, we've, we've actually moved beyond um, uh, questions, and, and I think they're prompted by the people in the community uh, who, are, who are listening in. Um, for instance, is there a space in the system to have input from Odano, that's the Oncology Drug Access Navigators of Ontario? Uh, there's, there's lots of good suggestions around um, how and where uh, uh, patients um, it might might play a, a role around that committee. Uh, so I, you know, I hope that a webinar like this will will continue to prompt um, ideas to come from the community. Mm -hmm. um, and it's now two o'clock, and 
you know, we didn't get to the RWE question. You know, let, let's hit that later. But from what I heard earlier, that's really fledgling. There's some, there's some challenges there, and you're open to ideas mm -hmm. in terms of how to actually make that work. Is, mm -hmm. is that correct? And do you want to do you want to address that, and then we'll turn it over to you for some final thoughts. Sure. Um, so I, you know, I guess I would just reiterate. I think our, our the commitment to collecting and using RWE is very strong, and we do have a common feeling across the country, at least with people that I work with. It, it will be a part of the cancer drug system at some point in the near future. But, but I think our opportunity is in, in the short term is to make sure that we understand where all the data is, how to use it, how to access it in a timely way, um, to even maybe back up this conversation so that when Health Canada is approving a new drug, if there's a need for real world evidence, maybe that should be part of that conversation. So I think there's a lot of groundwork that has to be laid. Um, but there's an awful lot of commitment, um, really from everybody that we've spoken to. We've heard that consistently. So I'm optimistic that although it's, it'll be a long process, that um, we've got enough commitment to start to advance it. So, um, Heather, I think we've actually uh, really covered a lot of the waterfront. However, there are still a ton of questions. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, we've talked about the why of, of CDAC and, and, and CAPCA. Um, how, I think, that, you know, you, you, what you've shared is, is helpful to fill in a few of the blanks. Uh, uh, but there are still some, there are going to be some ongoing questions that I anticipate. Um, and out of those questions, there are some suggestions about, about how. So I, I actually throw it back to the, uh, the community that's listening and, and, to, uh, um, and, and to everybody to, to think about that. Um, who is involved, um, especially from the patient community and how they can get more involved. Uh, and then what actually happens and when. So we've done the W5H of, uh, of CAPCA and the Drug Funding Sustainability Initiative. Do you have any final thoughts for the Canadian Cancer uh, Survivor Network, the listenership, that um, what's next, and 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 hopefully we can keep this conversation uh, going? Like, what would you like to, to to hear from the survivor community, and and to be able to make CAPCA more successful in what it's trying to do? Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. It's uh, I know that there are people who have a lot of questions, and this is an area that's. Um, you know, vitally important to a lot of people. Um, having spent time as a nurse with oncology patients and for their families, you know, it's not, these are not numbers and data and processes. These are families and people, um, brothers and sisters. So I just, I, I, I know you know that and you know that acutely living in your everyday lives, but I know it and so do we around the table. It is part of the, part of the essence of our work. Um, so what I'd like to hear is if there was something net new that you don't see in that final summary report that went out from the consultation that is important and would change the dynamic or the discussion, um, you know, by all means, I'm accessible. I try to be as accessible as I can. I know that people might be frustrated that I've had many, many requests to meet and to have phone calls. And frankly, if we did all of them, we wouldn't get any work done. So it is a bit of a it's a difficult choice sometimes to figure out how to have those meetings in a really productive way. But if you see something that's missing in that report that we need to know, I invite you to reach out to me. Um, and I share your sentiment about the importance of the dialogue. It's, um, it's the only, this is our country. We'll, some of us will get cancer, some of us will know people that do, but we'll also get other diseases and we need to make the right decision for this country together. I believe that and I believe the people I work with believe that. Thank you so much, Heather, for, uh, for, for sharing your, your perspectives on behalf of, of CAPCA. And, um, you know, I'd like to just end with thanking uh, you and, and uh, the association for, for coming in and, and speaking in, in a forum that uh, is one of those opportunities for really robust, thoughtful uh, dialogue. And uh, I hope that I can say that this is to be continued because um, this is probably the most uh, uh, well-attended webinar so far of, of 2017, there's huge interest in it. Uh, and the more we, we, we talk through uh, these issues, I, I, we, I hope that, the, you know, that, that you'll, you'll take something away from it as well, but this has been helpful for you. So uh, once again, thank you for, uh, on behalf of um, the CCSN. Maybe back to you, Chad, for some final thoughts, and then we'll, we'll close the broadcast. But thank you, everyone, for, for, for typing in and for listening. Uh, let's keep this conversation going. Yeah, so I just want to, Heather, I just want to echo what Bill said and thank you for um, taking part today. And Bill, thank you for sharing this uh, great discussion. Just a reminder that this webinar will be available online tomorrow with the full video on YouTube as well as the slides, which will be on our SlideShare account. Um, links to both will be sent out tomorrow afternoon. So thank you to everyone for attending and your participation, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon.